A very good evening, everybody. On behalf of Voice of Healthcare, allow me to welcome all the speakers and the attendees who have joined in this evening today. As all of us know, the month of October has been recognized as Bone and Joint Health Awareness Month. On that note, in collaboration with Zytus, we have taken an initiative to recognize this by organizing a series of virtual discussions in the note of public health awareness. Today, on October 20, we mark World Osteoporosis Day. In the view of this awareness initiative, we have our experts with us who shall enlighten us with the common do's and don'ts and lifestyle interventions to maintain our bone health. The topic for today's discussion for Osteoporosis Day is bone health, do's, don'ts, and lifestyle interventions. Further on, I'd like to introduce the speakers for today. We have Dr. Mehul Sarkar, he is consultant spine surgeon at Saksham Clinic and Dr. Vasant Rao Pawar Medical College, Hospital and Research Center. Welcome, Dr. Mehul. We have uh, Dr. Akhil Vashne with us. He is professor and head orthopedics at ABV Government Medical College, Madhya Pradesh. Welcome, Dr. Atul. We have Dr. Mohan K. Puttaswamy with us. He is orthopedic and joint replacement surgeon at Department of Re Reconstructive Orthopedics and Joint Replacement Surgery, Fortis Hospital, Banir Ghattagur, Bangalore. Welcome, Dr. Mohan. We have Dr. Nitin Tucker with us. He is Joint Replacement at Trauma Surgeon at Gettwell Hospital, Ahmedabad. Welcome, Dr. Nitin. Thank you. We have Dr. Deepa Kinamdar with us. He is Senior Orthopedic and Joint Replacement Surgeon at Dr. Deepa Kinamdar Orthopedic and Joint Replacement Center and Apollo Hospital. Dr. Adil Sunavani, he is Consultant Orthopedic Surgeon at Dr. Sunavani Ortho Care Clinic, Pune. Welcome, Dr. Adil. With this, I'd also uh, like to introduce Dr. Jeet Savla with us. He is consultant orthopedic surgeon at Apollo Spectra Hospital, Mumbai. Welcome, Dr. Jeet. Thank you. Um, with this, I'd also like to let our audience know that Dr. Mohan would also be moderating this discussion with us along with leading with his expert views. So without any further time, I uh, request Dr. Mohan to let's begin with the discussion. Thank you. So. I think this is an extremely important topic. It's under-recognized, under-treated, and has a huge impact on the society and community. So I'm very excited to meet uh, this, uh, you know, an erudite panel of uh, experts who are all clinicians who are practicing uh, and taking care of patients with osteoporosis and its complications. So I think in the next one hour, we can have a exciting talk about what are the basics of uh, managing uh, osteoporosis and their expertise, how do they... Uh, manage these uh, problems. So, my first question will be to Dr. Mehul. So, what are the risk factors associated with uh, osteoporosis? You know, uh, just for our audience to help them uh, understand that better. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, it's an honor to uh, share a panel session with you guys. So, uh, basically, osteoporosis means that there is some loss of mineralization in the bone, and there are multiple risk factors which. Uh, cause this problem. So traditionally, we have been uh, taught and we know to divide into two parts. So there are some risk factors which we cannot change. Uh, and there are some risk factors which we can change. And there are some disease factors which can also lead to osteoporosis. So first, talking about uh, risk factors that we cannot change. The first is gender. So most commonly what we see is that the female gender is more commonly associated with osteoporotic problems than compared to males. Uh, the females tend to lose bone mass quickly uh, after in the fifth or sixth decade of their life and then it goes on gradually increasing after that. In males, usually it hits after 70 or 75 years of age. So obviously gender is something which you cannot change at this point. Uh, the next risk factor is age. So as we said, uh, in women, it's usually the fifth and sixth decade after the menopause or the, in the perimenopausal period, that's when osteoporosis actually starts. In men, it's a bit delayed because of testosterone, which is still there in the body and in the, the test is being uh, producing it regularly. So it starts to manifest after around 70 years of age. Saying all this, uh, there is another risk factor called as stature. So uh, people who have a small, smaller stature, who are thinly built, not much muscular, have a higher tendency of having osteoporotic problems in their uh, in later life as compared to people who are well built or have a tall height. Now, 
Uh, if you compare the ethnicities, uh, Indians and uh, Caucasians, Asians are more prone to uh, osteoporosis as compared to African Asian because probably their muscle mass is more as compared to ours. Uh, there is a certain uh, family history to it. If your family uh, history has a history of osteoporosis, your grandmother, or probably your uh, grandfather or mother, uh, then there's a higher chance that you might also develop something of that sort in the future. Uh, coming to uh, problems which we can actually change. So uh, the first is lifestyle. Now, more commonly, uh, people who have a uh, sedentary lifestyle are more prone to developing. So is that uh, I think we'll keep it for the later half of the discussion. Okay, so, okay. Uh, like after understanding the risk factors, uh, you know, uh, if Dr. Uh, Jeet Saula can, can come in. So, what are the common signs and symptoms you look out for, you know, in one of our osteoporotic patients? What do you look out for when you see those patients? Good evening, sir. Uh, so the yes. thing is, I commonly refer to osteoporosis as a silent disease because there are no uh, proper signs and symptoms that an osteoporotic patient will show. These are generalized symptoms like multiple bony pains or else a deformity in the back, a gradual deformity in the back which is seen over a period of years. There might be some loss in height. A patient who has fracture after a trivial injury or history of multiple fractures in a year. These are some of the signs and symptoms that indicate that there might be osteo underlying osteoporosis that might be causing these problems. As such, there are no uh, hard and fast signs and symptoms that an osteoporotic patient will show. It's only just bony pains or fractures. Most of the osteoporotic patients are diagnosed once they have incurred some sort of fracture or the other. Or if they've come to the consultation with some x-ray which is showing osteopenia, which brings our notice to the fact that the patient might be suffering from osteoporosis. Okay. So, uh, actually, you know, I want to kind of make a point here for all the audience members. We call osteoporosis as a you know, silent disease or iceberg phenomena, practically you don't have any signs and symptoms. And we only see them when there are complications. So uh, whenever uh, there is, in the West, we have screening programs in India, unfortunately we don't. So this is something which you have to keep in mind. Anybody after 65 years, osteoporosis is a silent disease and we have to kind of look out for it, like hypertension. So if I can bring Dr. Atul Vashne in, so what factors can determine the incidence of osteoporosis? You know, if you have to look at age or demography, what do you think? Even habits, lifestyle? Yeah, yeah, definitely lifestyle uh, is a big factor because persons with uh, lifestyle, sedentary lifestyles will have osteoporosis in early age group. And uh, um, age, in my clinical practice, what I see usually the patients, uh, the post-menopausal women, like, so age is definitely a factor. And then uh, people indulge in smoking and uh, alcohol, other habits are also a risk factor. So, Dr. Nitin, what do you think are the common challenges in managing osteoporotic uh, patients, you know, both from, say, let's say from your perspective as well as from the patient perspective. What are your experiences? Um, there are certain challenges in the management of the osteoporosis. I see it as a, at three levels mainly. One is at the level of prevention, one is at the level of the diagnosis, and the third is at the level of the treatment. On the prevention side, as uh, we all know that it is a uh, relatively silent disease, and that's why uh, most of the patients are, they are unaware of unaware about the existence of the osteoporosis in themselves until they have any fragility factors. So till as, you know, as a clinician, sometimes we have a certain doubt about having a, a strong doubt about having osteoporosis, but patients are very reluctant about going for the, any further investigation in the form of uh, either DEXA scan or uh, they also uh, deny about the routine treatment uh, like you know, uh, calcium and vitamin D intake and all the lifestyle modification like you know daily regular exercise uh, 
quitting the smoking and alcohol abhi to abhi dispatch kahan kar rahe hain to unse ha ki unhe bol rahe hain ki ye prarambh ha can i request all the panelists if they are not uh, making any move your phones please sabke sign ho bolna purv mein aapke sambhagal ke sign nahi the yes sorry yeah dr nitin uh, sorry sorry for the interruption second yeah. thing is uh, at the level of the diagnosis uh, still in india we are facing that the dexa scan uh, is not available widely uh, which is the gold standard for the uh, diagnosis of the osteoporosis in a established way and for starting the uh, other major treatment third is at the level of the treatment uh, most of the patients uh, you know uh, they are very re- reluctant about the injectable therapy so whenever uh, uh, we prescribe them the uh, current uh, injectable uh, treatment which is a very effective in uh, uh, curing this osteoporosis uh, they are very re- reluctant uh, particularly because of the cost constraint and compliance related to the, this injectable therapy uh, we have a limitations about treating this condition completely okay if i can ask dr deepak uh, what fractures are most common see in our uh, practice where do you see you know osteoporotic fractures and uh, you know kind of please elaborate on that yeah <clears throat> good evening everyone i am uh, uh, happy and uh, thankful for the panel and discussion as already elaborated by the others uh, osteoporosis is something which we all encounter in our daily practice under diagnosed under treated and uh, hardly any patient education so usually when you get a patient with a fracture is when the diagnosis happens and then the treatment starts by the time i feel it's already too late patient patients are in their 70s or 80s uh, this uh, patient education should be started much earlier rather than considering it as a disease uh it should be considered as a phenomena which almost every human being will undergo osteoporosis uh, in the, in their lifetimes and calcium supplementation and other things should be started much earlier. so the fractures which we encounter commonly as all of you would have uh, encountered in the practice one is wrist fracture called as a distal radius fracture following the real fall two is a spine fracture uh, the most common mode is either uh fall uh, down or they might slip and fall uh, fallen on their back or even a small trivial road accident where there in the vehicle travels a big road hump is enough cause a spine fracture the second the third thing a uh, shoulder fracture the shoulder fractures otherwise in our terminology which the general public may not know is called as a proximal humeral fracture and the last but not the least is a hip fracture hip fracture is extremely important for the reason that it mobility in hip fractures once again one sees two kinds of fractures one is called as a fracture of the femoral head and the called as a trochanteric fracture the trochanteric fracture uh, uh, needs to be fixed whereas the Uh, fracture neck of the femur we replace it with the ball wherein the ball is cut so these are the uh, most commonly encountered so called osteoporotic fractures which all of us encounter in our day to day practice yeah so uh, if i can bring dr atul sonavne now <clears throat> so what do you think are the you know spine issues with osteoporosis and uh, what fractures do you see in your practice which level of spine Uh, I guess Dr. Sonavne is not around. Is Hello. Hello. Sir, uh, it was for uh, Dr. Atul Sonavne. I was just uh, waiting for him. so yeah we'll we'll just kind of uh, proceed with our uh, discussion once he's around we'll have the conversation so dr mehul what do you think is the role of menopause you know uh, 
women it's very common and uh, your thoughts on menopause and osteoporosis yes sir so the menopause is one of the most significant uh, condition which affects our bone calcium levels and is a definitive risk factor for uh, developing osteoporosis estrogen is a safety hormone in females which usually is developed by the ovaries and has a very uh, good effect on calcium absorption from the gut and deposition of the bone uh, develop calcium in the bones and other reducing the resorption from the bones itself so when the menopause hits the estrogen doesn't is not secreted anymore so all these safety factors come down and that leads to higher uh, loss of bone uh, calcium levels and excretion of calcium starts from the body itself so osteoporosis is definitely linked with menopause menopausal women post menopausal women are very much highly prone to develop osteoporosis if it is not be uh, diagnosed properly or treated early or calcium supplement not started early they is definitely going to have a problem of course is so, our uh, clinical practice yeah yeah sorry sorry please proceed yeah that's fine that's fine so in my clinical practice i usually do spine so most of these people come with a trivial history of fall and having complex fractures in mostly in the d11 and d12 region uh they usually in the age group of around 65 to 70 when uh, after menopause they haven't been counseled enough or they haven't been taking any kind of supplements or any kind of hormone replacement therapy which leads to even more uh, chances of having these fractures after trivial fall and trivial injuries so i mean just to summarize for the layman now do you think it's safe to say that lower back is unprotected by the ribs so if yes. they fall and they have some low back pain we have to kind of think of osteoporotic fractures rather than neglect it and you know i've seen in my practice where they get neglected and they can come with uh, neurological complications so definitely uh, definitely yeah public who are viewing you know any low back pain in a 60 year old person after, even after a trivial fall don't think it's a muscular pain meet a doctor sure. now uh, dr g uh, if you can uh, come in you know what are your thoughts of with the western world and osteoporosis in india is there a difference how do you see this uh, problem so the biggest uh, difference between our people and the western world i guess should be the awareness the level of awareness that is there amongst uh, our people uh, i have after i have a few friends who are practicing in us uk the level of awareness over there is way more than what it is over here so we definitely need to work on the awareness with the general public so that these problems can be tackled at a early stage rather than waiting for the last stage where there are already complications that have developed after which we end up treating those complications and uh, a major chunk of our effort treating the complications rather than treating the condition it's always better to treat prevent the condition rather than treat the complications arising out of it so awareness should play a major role in it also so i have seen that maybe because of the uh, lifestyle over there or maybe the medical scenario out there people tend to visit the doctor at quite an early stage as compared to what we see over here most of my patients will come and see uh will come to my clinic once the problem is not that trivial so like they'll first try to do all their home remedies and everything and by the time they'll end up coming to the doctor the problem will end up being more complicated than what it was earlier so once we work on this awareness with the people and the people can regularly do their dexa scan after a particular like after the age of 50 uh we can counsel the patient to do regular dexa scans monitor their calcium vitamin d and all then i guess so uh, this problem uh, should not be that big a issue to tackle uh, as compared to the western world where these things are regularly being done so uh, you know if i can uh, add in here because see i uh, did my fellowship training in the us so one thing which is uh, a huge difference from a western world to our system is the lack of primary care you know in the west if you ask any patient who's your primary care doctor they know there is a primary care doctor and there are screening programs for all the patients you know the uh, pcp is they call so they screen their patients they send them because there is national level screening programs for osteoporosis in uh, many western countries so they need to undergo dexa scan once they have uh, menopause at 55 and things like that so 
the reason i brought this up is a lot of our indian patients they they get chance to meet uh, specialists super specialists in one or two days but unfortunately if you ask them who is their doctor none of them have any answer so basically they have a cardiologist there's a nephrologist there's an orthopedic surgeon but none of them have a primary care doctor so this becomes a challenge in uh, two fronts especially after covid with the number of patients who have received steroids osteoporosis and avascular necrosis is a huge thing so for the listening audience my take home message is please keep a chart of all the medicines and whenever you go to one of your specialists please mention that you are on these medications and you know many of us will be able to kind of guide you about to meeting a physician and taking their opinion as and when to look at the risk factors so if i can bring dr vashne in sir what do you think you know are the protocols that need to be set in our society like we said we don't have any protocol so for the screening protocols and any advancements in screening you want to talk about and uh, you know treatment modality like say a calcaneal ultrasound your thoughts on these uh, uh, screening modalities sir dr vashne atul vashne okay so you know now uh, since we have dr uh, atul sonavne here uh dr atul what are the common spine issues in uh, osteoporosis especially the spine fractures like we discussed about it, but uh, you know again when we are looking at uh, area specific spine fractures your thoughts are see osteoporosis primarily in many patients presents as back pain so many of the patient especially uh perimenopausal uh, women and nowadays in even younger population also they complain of back pain so yes so osteopenia is the starting uh, issue and then it progresses to osteoporosis but uh, uh, like after 40 years of age many female who are having back pain uh and uh, even other uh, symptoms of osteoporosis they are screened by bone uh, mineral density and they are found to have a very low bone mass nowadays because of their lifestyle uh, issues and uh, lack of any uh, healthy lifestyles exercises dietary habits so Uh, many times i have found the scores below minus 4 minus 5 as well very commonly and uh, the regarding fractures in old days the fractures are uh, very commonly seen uh, basically they come with a hunched back and uh, the posture is changed and that is how they represent so when we get the x ray the most common site found is uh, dorsal lumbar junction dl junction so those fractures basically are wedge compression fractures and uh, it's not like it happens suddenly it's over over a period of time they develop this posture and then uh, they develop these fractures do you think there's any difference in treatment between uh, say general osteoporosis and osteoporosis of the spine uh, especially when it comes to medicines which we use yeah, any specific focus on uh, you know for symptomatic uh, for not specifically i don't uh, differentiate the treatment but uh, it basically depends on the uh, age group of the patient as well as uh, the score in the bmd scan so if it is a younger uh, uh, age group obviously if it is having a very low score bone marrow density uh, bone mineral density then we need to find out any other metabolic causes for so low score and then accordingly treat that and uh, if it is in the uh, like uh, in the osteopenia group i usually treat it by once a year uh, bisphosphonate that is hyaluronic acid injection and then continue them with uh, vitamin d calcium supplements and uh, oral bisphosphonate as well and in osteoporotic groups who are having very low score so there are very good results with uh, teriparatid injections and uh, this uh, uh, denosumab so i give them uh, 
combination therapy to patients who basically have got fractures as well as osteoporosis then i definitely recommend the combination therapy of teriparatide and uh, denosumab okay so you know i have my uh, endocrine colleagues who keep telling that you know calcitonin nasal spray works very well for spinal fracture pain not just for osteoporosis but so you know it's an adjuvant for uh, pain in uh, spinal fractures so if i can if dr atul bashne is around sir are you around yeah i i think we'll just take it forward dr nitin what do you think uh, in india we can do differently to educate our patients regarding osteoporosis yes uh, visibility is an important factor for any problems to solve it so i think uh, uh, we can create uh, uh, awareness about the osteoporosis in the society by various means the first and foremost is uh, we always want to have a prevention at the you know best level because prevention is the best treatment i think and uh, that's why uh, uh, we should conduct uh, 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 various uh, um celebration in the form of a uh, sports activity or a lecture by specialist doctors to the schools and colleges particularly all children and adolescent age group because uh, there we can get the maximum level of you know our uh, uh, bone mass index as we all know that you know we are able to gain this bone mass index up to the age of the 30 years and that is the best time we can you know uh, uh, take it to the highest level which will be a most important factor for future you know uh, prevention of the osteoporosis so uh, uh, getting them uh, a knowledge about uh, osteoporosis at the you know beginning of their life is uh, along with their parents we should invite for such kind of activity second most important thing is uh, i see is you know in a western world uh, many health insurance companies are uh, uh, providing uh, certain rewards and discount uh, if uh, one is uh, involved in the daily sports activity like uh, in today's scenario in india also we are seeing that various private insurance companies are having their own app which measures persons daily or uh, physical exercise and they uh, give some uh, rewards and discount another thing is that these companies should also uh, give discount or uh, uh, they should uh, give reimbursement for the having dexa scan in the patient who are above the age of 50 or who, who are having a secondary osteoporosis because this will be beneficial to the companies because if a person can uh, prevent osteoporosis then the uh, future chances of fracture will be reduced and that will be a direct benefit to the insurance health insurance companies so i think uh, uh, they should talk about this thing third thing uh, most of the uh, our uh, physician doctors uh, we orthopedic surgeons uh, practitioners they are also conducting certain camp activity related to bone health uh, i also request to the certain imaging centers who is having a facility of the dexa scan they should also discount uh, this uh, charges on a regular interval uh, uh, regular uh, time period uh, fourth is the uh, various social media campaign in today's scenario uh, like uh, today's activity is a very uh, beneficial activity to the population regarding the awareness regarding uh, this osteoporosis prevention and do's and don'ts so social media uh, activity in the form of a, a webinar uh, on the facebook instagram and radio and tv programs uh, conducted by uh, doctors panel and uh, fifth thing is a road show uh, including a walkathon or cyclothon which uh, you know motivate the society to particip- participate in the such kind of health program uh, which is beneficial for prevention of the osteoporosis and creating its awareness last uh, uh, government should also uh, participate uh, by uh, uh, putting some holdings in the city related to the osteoporosis as uh, you know government is involved in other diseases like you know hiv and tuberculosis but they are very silent about this silent disease so i think government should also involve Uh, uh about putting this holdings and advertisement uh, on newspaper uh, so i think uh, this much uh, awareness program can create a good impact on the society yeah 
I think it's a wonderful point. You hit the nail on the head, especially the concept of peak bone mass. Uh, many people are uh, unaware about this. So, uh, expanding on the point, you know, especially girl kids, they reach if the peak bone mass they reach is less in their uh, mid twenties. So they'll drift into osteoporosis in their fifties. So we keep losing bone. <laughs> So uh, I think my as co-panelists would uh, be in uh, sync with my thoughts that the girl kid has to play more. If there are two kids in the house, it's actually the girl child who has to play more. Uh, you know, thereby her peak bone mass she attains is higher, and thus in her fifties uh, she is not at risk of uh, osteoporosis. So I keep telling all the families if there are two kids in house, boy and a girl, let the boy do all the household chores and let the girl uh, keep playing. Because the peak bone mass is extremely important, and that's the only age where we can naturally change the bone density. Once they have uh, they reach their uh, mid twenties, the bone uh, density is kind of set. Now, if I can request Dr. Deepak, uh, you know, what do you think are uh, severe spinal osteoporosis therapeutics which we have? You now, a lot of us see gaps in our uh, healthcare delivery mechanism. What else can be done for uh, you know prevention of uh, osteoporosis? So, everyone. So, the spine fracture, as everyone has elaborated here, are quite common. Uh, it's seen in people in their sixties and seventies uh, with a trivial fall, D twelve L one being the spine fractures. And uh, most often, it's not diagnosed. As to uh, it, the by the time the patient comes, it's only seen uh, on an X-ray or a CT scan, and then a diagnosis happens, and then the treatment starts. As to the treatment modalities and the gaps, I think most of you have already elaborated. First is the patient education. Uh, there is hardly any education about osteoporosis and its treatment. Uh, as the previous speaker told, the government and the public, the general public, there is hardly any awareness and more has to be done about bone and joint health. The bone health being osteoporosis and the joint health being arthritis. Both of them are underdiagnosed and undertreated and there is a huge epidemic of both rampant has to be done. Uh, regarding the patient education. Uh, Dr. Nitin has already elaborated the met met various methods of patient education. Uh, so this is a, a big gap. Uh, the government can do various programs uh, in the television and media about osteoporosis, diagnosis especially. Regarding the treatment, with uh, there not being a proper diagnosis, there, there is no treatment and by the time the patient reaches us, he or she has already has had a fracture and he has gone through the whole gamut of osteoporosis and it's a little bit too late. What all of us are treating right now is, uh, I, I would call it like a just for our satisfaction and for the patient's satisfaction, the patient hardly knows that the, he is in the peak of osteoporosis and we as orthopedicians can only do so much when you are treating an osteoporotic fracture at 70s or 80s. Uh, thankfully, at least now we have drugs like uh, denoxumab and teriparatide. Previously, a few years back, we didn't even have that in our armamentarium to treat these patients with uh, such uh, good therapeutic means. So I think uh, the, in the present scenario where all of us are dealing with and treating only osteoporotic fractures, none of us are at that stage where we diagnose and pick it up much earlier. Uh, teriparatide and denoxumab, both of them are, are I think, uh, very good drugs for treatment. Apart from the usual calcium, vitamin D, calcitonin and bisphosphonates, uh, the, the various choice of bisphosphonates, whether being giving it a weekly one or a monthly one dose or a yearly one with zoledronic acid, uh, we uh, at present have a very wide uh, gamut of options uh, where we can use and treat it more aggressively than what we could do uh, maybe five or ten years back. What is needed right now, I feel, is more patient awareness, more public awareness, which I think this is one uh, talk where wherein uh, the public will be benefited a lot. And uh, with the excellent advice given by all of you, uh, 
I think things sh- things should uh, go in the right direction with more of these uh, awareness camps. So uh, you know, uh, I have a few uh, points to again uh, highlighters, and uh, you know, you people can. Uh, come in as and when uh, if there is a slight difference in uh, thought process so uh, there are a few uh, now speaking of the other side we see a lot of patients who uh, keep taking calcium uh, you know supplements without any need so this is for the other extreme you know these google patients so one of the take home messages is there is data coming from uh, scandinavian countries that if you take excessive calcium the risk of heart attack and strokes go up by uh, 20% so generally what is advised is if there is a diagnosed osteoporosis it's important to take calcium supplements but otherwise if you are a healthy active adult you don't need to take calcium supplementation so i does my co panelists agree on this uh, point uh, i think the second and the third generation calciums are relatively safer compared to the first generation calcium uh, and uh, yeah the, that's a valid point that uh, 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 unless indicated one patient have to take an early calcium supplementation one can start in either 50s for a woman and a little later for a man i would like to uh, uh, for the thoughts of other panelists also on this i have agreed with uh, dr deepak that you know around the who guideline we should follow the who guideline post menopausal women should get uh, the required calcium until unless it is contraindicated by other uh, pathologies and uh, in men it should be little de- uh, delayed until unless proven by the uh, dexa scan that he is not having he is having osteoporosis yeah so uh, again for the general audience you know, the the recommendation is strong recommendation is to take natural calcium so the simple thumb rule what i tell for all my uh, south karnataka or south indian patients is if you are able to eat ragi ragi is a tremendous source of natural calcium it has about 375 mg in 100 grams of ghee you can make a porridge or a ragi ball and eat you get adequate calcium and for north indians rajma so rajma has about 275 to 300 mg of uh, calcium in 100 grams so incorporating it in daily diet is the key so natural source of uh, most scandinavian guidelines do talk about natural source of calcium and in times of need like we discussed the reason i bring this topic up is you find young adults young women there on calcium and vitamin d supplements because you know they keep telling that you have to take so we have to also discourage whom not to take so we have to encourage people to take but the counterpoint is we have to discourage patients who don't need to take from taking uh, calcium supplement so that's why i brought that thought in so the second thought is you know nowadays a lot of screening grants are done by you know the heel ultrasound uh, scans so what are your thoughts how do you handle a patient gets a t score of minus 3 on a heel ultrasound how do you guys uh, handle it because this is a very relevant thing this is a common screening uh, <laughs> for osteoporosis done in the community see guys the screening tool ultrasound based uh, investigation is okay but that is not so much reliable thing so the most reliable score what we get is from dexa scan that is dual energy x ray absorptiometry and that is more reliable that to done at spine and hips level so heel based ultrasound is uh, okay as a screening tool but should not be relied upon very much i think nowadays uh, given q city is coming into vogue uh, some some studies have actually challenged the effectiveness of dexa to accurately uh, estimate the amount of osteoporosis so nowadays q city is being more reliable uh, a tool a gold standard probably an upcoming gold standard to get it but it's not commonly available everywhere so i think uh, as a screening tool uh, ultrasound in the heels is fine but if you reach a mark that a patient fits a certain profile that he has a very bad a uh, score on the ultrasound of the heel he also has a lot of back pain issues or other uh, symptoms relating to osteoporosis we should get in at more detail and get a full uh, calcium profile as well as a dexa scan to start with and then we can base our treat from those parts i think uh, the Adi. message to general public yeah. should be that to get a uh, uh, heel ultrasound at one of these camps if you by chance need to and have already got it done and if you are in the borderline in your 
feel ultrasound, then you go ahead and get a DEXA scan. If you are relatively safe in your heel ultrasound, then you needn't have to get a, a DEXA scan. I think that should be the take home message for the public who is watching this, that the heel ultrasound is a screening tool and DEXA is a more definitive assessment. So only if you fall into the osteoporotic category in your heel ultrasound, you need to go ahead and do a DEXA scan to confirm whether you are really in that category. Because there are some minor errors in your heel uh, ultrasound uh, DEXA, I mean, uh, report. Okay, so... Uh, I think, uh, clinician should... Uh, sorry, uh, I also want to make one point. As a clinician, uh, we should uh, see this as a, you know, uh, in a whole picture. Like, you know, having a history of uh, certain uh, medical comorbidities, having a sedentary lifestyle along with their having a back pain, having a BMD score less than minus 2.5, and if the facility is available, then go for the DEXA scan. So you should, uh, as a, uh, we clinicians should have, uh, look this as a whole picture, not, uh, we should not rely only on the uh, this BMD report. So whenever there is a facility of the DEXA scan, one should go for the DEXA scan, according to DEXA scan, uh, you can go further, further, further treatment. Yeah. So if I can summarize my uh, friends and co-panelists, so this is extremely important for the uh, layperson. If you are in an urban setting, uh, you have access, money is not an issue, heel ultrasound is definitely a screening test, no treatment. But if it's a rural setup, you don't have access, there is a bad T-score, it is okay to go ahead and meet a doctor and then take calcium supplements based on advice, medical advice, you know. We pick a proper calcium vitamin D combination to treat uh, osteoporosis. It is an art, it is a medical decision. So please don't self-medicate based on a screening program. So that is number one take-home uh, message. Second thing, you can increase uh, natural uh, calciums on your own. You don't need medical advice for uh, taking natural calcium. But don't take... <laughs> calcium and vitamin D without uh, medical advice. So if facilities are there, DEXA scan has to be done and then go for treatment. Now the next question to my co-panelists is, uh, how often do you uh, say a patient is osteoporotic if started on uh, teriparatide or uh, denosumab? How often should uh, somebody get a repeat DEXA scan? I think six months is a fair enough time to get a repeat DEXA scan after starting teriparatide because it has higher potential. Or even when he's on dysfunction or something like that. Because some uh, positive change in the DEXA scan scores, which will guide towards treatment, whether you have to step it up or you have to keep uh, the same thing going for a year or two, till we reach the target level of going into osteopenia on the green side. Because I would practice in my I do I do in my practice. Any other thoughts? So I think it should be done after a year or so because within six months it's difficult to find any changes. The bone doesn't uh, show much changes in six months. So if it is actually on teriparatide or more aggressive therapy, patient has having very low scores, then get it after a year. And otherwise, routinely you can uh, ask the patients to do the DEXA scans every two years. Yeah, I think I think that's a fair uh, this one once in two years because this uh, this involves some sort of an exposure. So I think it's a decent period. Maybe one to two years is a good gap. Uh, one needn't have to get it uh, too often. What is more important is you, you are in some sort of a therapy during the interim period. So yeah, I mean uh, the reason I put you know. Uh... Since I work in a tertiary care hospital, I get a lot of patients. Every six months, they want a DEXA scan. Things are not changing, so they come in hyper. So I generally don't repeat uh, DEXA for once, uh, I mean, within two years. So get a DEXA done, put them on uh, whatever appropriate therapy the me or my endocrine uh, friends do pitch in and uh, take care. But very often, repeating a DEXA scan is radiation exposure as well as a psychological stress on the families. So uh, I think... Uh, Based on the clinical situation, you know, like what uh, Dr. Nitin said, if it is very necessary, yes, we can do it. But otherwise, spacing it out, even guidelines, bodies say once in uh, two years, uh, okay. In my practice, now, I also all of us, have uh, Dr. Mohan, yes, yeah, sorry, I yes. also have a similar yeah. thought. Yes, I, I also do the DEXA scan after two years because you know, sometimes uh, doing it after one year and most of the time, we don't. Uh, 
don't see much you know increase in the dexascan that disappoint the patient and might you know uh, most of the uh, patient they doubt your treatment and they might discontinue the current treatment so i think uh, uh, we know that teriparatide is a uh, on uh, uh, in a lifetime we can give only one time so i think uh, uh, we should consider this medicine uh, to uh, complete the uh, the course of the two years and then after uh, because when we ask the patient most of these patients after starting teriparatide along with the uh, denosumab or uh, uh, alone uh, they they improve in their uh, symptoms so clinical uh, symptoms are uh, you know they have improved but in, uh, on a dexa scan uh, the report might uh, improve after one or two years of time so it is better to do it after two years of the completion of the at least teriparatide I completely agree. So, just uh, one more point because see, I have had this uh, problem which I have dealt. Whenever you we prescribe teriparatide injection, I tell all my patients upfront that there are uh, theoretical lab-based studies of increased incidence of uh, malignancies in animals, but there is no human data. So, because this is something you know, nowadays patients Google everything. So, to all the audience, so there is no clear evidence of increased risk of malignancies because of teriparatide. So there are certain changes which have been found in animal studies. So it's put as a disclaimer. So whenever you look at it, so don't stop taking medication because there is a higher theoretical risk of uh, malignancy, which is put on the label. So uh, that should be a take home message. Please, uh, for the general audience, again, the take home message is please trust your doctors. Uh, osteoporosis is a very silent disease. These are expensive medicines. We are not writing for any... Uh, you know, individual benefit or, uh, you know, the company's kind of uh, promoters or anything. Osteoporosis is a real world problem. And we have previously, uh, you know, Dr. Deepak made a very valid point. Ten years before, we were kind of helpless. We were in a horrible situation where we did not know how to help. Bisphosphonates actually don't increase the bone density. They kind of uh, change the curve of loss of bone. So with teriparated and denosumab, we have game-changing uh, medication. So Whenever doctors are prescribing certain medications because they are expensive, they are cumbersome to take, please don't start doubting your doctor. <clears throat> this is a long-standing problem. It takes years for things to get better. So please trust your uh, physicians and, and uh, continue uh, having the medicines because in the long run, it's a huge uh, difference. So any other thoughts any one of you have uh, regarding you know, present day and where do you think it is going to go forward? Uh, uh, Dr. Mohan, I'd like to make a, one very important point, I think, which uh, the general public should know. Two important things. One is your diet rich in calcium. Two, some sort of exercise. So uh, there is there can't be anything more important than these two till you reach your 50s or 60s and you continue doing these two things. Uh, this is important for all of us that you do some sort of an exercise, either walk, run, jog, swim, or any weight training, at least four to five times a week, at least minimum of 30 minutes. This is perhaps the most um, important thing that will prevent a rapid deterioration of your bone, which will prevent osteoporosis to a great extent, along with a diet which is rich in calcium and high protein diet. I think these two points can, cannot be overemphasized. All of us are dwelling on the treatment part and medication, but I think the general public needs to know these two things which will make a healthy person and which will prevent the rapid deterioration of bone mass. So, uh, how many hours a week uh, would you recommend, Dr. Deepak? Uh, see, uh, I think 30 minutes a day, at least four to five times a week is the minimum recommendation. So that should be good enough, some sort of an exercise. What the American Heart Association also recommends is that much, four to five times a week, 30. So I think all of us should be able to put in that much amount of exercise. That should be good enough. Yeah. Any other co-panelists had any other thoughts regarding this? Yes, uh, one more thing I want to highlight is the high risk patient for the fall. Because this old aged patient above the 50 years of uh, age, 
uh, like in you know, a post menopausal woman or any other uh, uh, person who is having other comorbid conditions like you know diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis or he is having a uh, steroid intake because of certain diseases uh, if these kind of patients uh, uh, who are osteoporotic and uh, if one finds uh, uh, certain diseases like neurological disorders or any other uh, things where, which makes them uh, to have a fracture with the trivial fall we should identify this group of people and we should uh, you know uh, embark uh, a treatment on them uh, so we can prevent uh, future fractures because once the fragility fracture occurs uh, there is a certain morbidity and mortality behind it and uh, i think treatment cost of the osteoporosis is much cheaper than the treatment cost of the fracture related to the osteoporosis uh, in a way of a monetary aspect and in the way of uh, physical harm physical harm uh, which surgery can do to them so i think identifying these high risk patient for a fall is an important factor uh, uh, that we should consider so i think that's a wonderful point see in my again in my practice to any elderly uh, family member my general counseling always is if you are unstable if you have some giddiness use a walking cane because most fractures happen inside the house so a walking cane prevents fall in about 20 30% of the time and in some very elderly people <coughs> even using a walker is recommended because fall prevention in itself is a, a huge topic but i think all of you would agree that uh, cane and uh, walker has a huge role in uh, preventing a fall is that a safe thing to tell yeah i i think that's quite safe and i uh, i think the, one of the most important uh, things which people are aware of is having the presence of uh, hand railings in the bathroom there is nothing more important than this. every bathroom with a senior citizen at home should have a hand railing on all sides so that there is something to grab on case in the bathroom as most fractures happen in the bathroom because it's a slippery surface with soap and other things so uh, something firm to hold on to so i think people should be made made aware of to install hand railings especially in uh, the bathroom senior citizens i think this is a very important thing. in continuation of that thing uh, prevention of the fall i think uh, one should have a uh, uh, you know regular check up of the eyes um, because you know low sightness is also a cause for the fall in the uh, this age group because of the cataract yeah. Uh, uh to light up the bulb at the night time or they should call their uh, you know uh, 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 children uh, to support them Uh, to go for the washroom at the night time because many times we have seen that the, they regret later on that you know i should have called to my son to help me to uh, go to the toilet and uh, the fracture occurs because of the that trivial troll, uh, fall at the inside the bath so, so they should uh, you know uh, keep this thing in their mind that prevention is the best treatment for them yeah so uh if i can summarize the whole uh, scenario you know after a discussion of for about an hour now so for the listening public the most important thing in the first three decades of life up to the age of 30 is being physically active especially in girl kids the more physically active they are jumping playing increases the peak bone mass they reach so that the risk of osteoporosis in their old age is uh, lesser and that prevents complications now between 20 30 to uh, 50 years i think when habit formations happen in our uh, you know uh, middle ages so moderate amount of alcohol is okay and absolutely no tobacco use it generally even alcohol is discouraged again physical activity the physical activity remains the same for the rest of the life but moderate amount of substance abuse and obesity management because once you are obese by the fifth decade of life it's extremely difficult or even impossible to lose weight after 50 years of age so in the middle ages it's about weight management and once we hit the real problem what we have not prevented it's an accumulated problem for five decades and if we have not been able to prevent then we are stuck in a bad situation called osteoporosis that's when all of us come in actually with uh, medical management surgical management and things like that so even once you reach there 
uh, if there is a diagnosed uh, osteoporosis or postmenopausal then self medication with calcium supplements is okay vitamin d again based on medical advice it has to be taken no blanket consumption of uh, calcium and vitamin d there are medicines there are various medicines we talked about so basically there are broad groups there are injections and tablets the tablets don't improve the bone density they actually maintain the bone density because we lose bone it actually maintains the bone density the injections the common injections you people heard were teriparatide and denosumab so these are two injections which we use based on clinical scenarios based on kidney function uh, some people get teriparatide if the kidney is bad we give denosumab which improve the bone density and again once there is a fall and a fracture happens the caring of the fractures itself is a challenge so if the take home message should be physical activity adequate calcium and diet uh, calcium with supervision from uh, physicians i guess uh, you know i leave it to my co panelists for their uh, final conclusions if they have any other thoughts please uh, feel free to kind of uh, round it up for me no, that is excellent Excellent summary, Dr. Mohan. Yeah, I think that pretty much summarizes everything. Uh, osteoporosis uh, should be more uh, thought of as a condition. I wouldn't uh, call it as a disease. It happens to everyone. Just the amount of osteoporosis which you develop. So it's completely preventable. One can slow down the progress of uh, osteoporosis. and uh, the various methods as uh, dr mohan has told a good diet rich in calcium good protein rich diet good amount of exercise stay physically active especially as you grow older and older the ones who get into problems are the physically inactive ones the, uh, the if you are not into some sort of a physical activity you tend to get into some sort of uh, a problem so that may not be with just osteo osteoporotic fractures it will be even diabetes so everything is related to your physical activity so that forms an essential part of health especially as you grow older and older into your fourth fifth and sixth decades of life people who are healthy are the ones who are extremely physically active so that should be the take home message for everyone uh, as a part of discussion for not just osteoporosis but also diabetes and hypertension and cardiac all of them have a common denominator as in uh, physical activity a good physical activity will uh, reduce the chances of you getting any of these problems and i think not to ignore prolonged back pain uh, problems in your say 50 or 60s you should consider a doctor for that so i think uh, you know uh, i thank all of you for uh, taking time out of your uh, busy practice hopefully the listening public have had a wonderful session you know had some good uh, take home messages so i really thank uh, whole heartedly for all of you to uh, come on this uh, program this platform trying to educate the uh, audience regarding the same so it's wonderful being and with you guys thank you thanks a lot of uh, and thank you dr mohan thank you all of you my co panelists it was an extremely good session uh, and it was a, a pleasure being with all of you today evening thank you all thank, thank you so all much thank you so much thank you for involving me in this panel discussion thank you